Okie doke, good evening or whatever time of day it is for you. I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to be talking about contro control structures in Python. As always, I always like to open up with just a reminder of um, our class rules and expectations. In case you forget, do stay muted if you're not speaking. Um, but if you want to speak, use that raise hand button. Um, if you just unmute and start speaking, then it really confuses me um, because I can't see who is speaking. So I just ask that you use the raise hand button and then we can make sure that everyone gets to ask their questions. I don't miss anything. Uh, feel free to type questions in the chat or Discord at any time. We always have our very, very lovely TAs in there. Um, say hi to a TA if you can. They're working very hard. Also, um, I may ask you to use Zoom icons, um, but your video can be on or off, however you would like to participate in class. As always, you can email me or ask TAs uh, questions on Discord. And the syllabus does have uh, answers to most questions, including an invite link to the Discord, which I think it maybe expires today. So if you still haven't signed up for Discord and you'd like to, I'll probably put a new invite on there um, tomorrow. Okay, and as always, let's have fun with class. <laughs> yes, always good to appreciate our TAs. Oh, and I forgot, I, I included this last time. Um, just make sure that when you're emailing me, um, I have lots and lots of things that I'm managing. I do teach classes at Vanderbilt um, besides this one. And so um, I won't always know what you're talking about if you just email me with a question without any explanation. So, um, do please uh, introduce yourself uh, if you are emailing me or just say that you're part of Aspen Bootcamp or something, and then I can usually um, respond within a few days. So do please be patient with us there. Um, and then I also have this little blog uh, post okay. if you want more uh, Thanks, information on, if you want more information on um, emailing someone, sorry. Make sure you're muted. Sorry, I was just trying to find. All right. Cool. Awesome. So for today's class, we are going to be using Google Colab because I promised I would show you how to use Google Colab last time. Um, but if you prefer Replit, you're welcome to use it. But I do encourage you to get at least some experience with Google Colab. So we will be doing that today looking at uh, Google Colab with our code, and I'll walk you through it. So it should be good. Let's go ahead and get those open, and we can begin. If there are any questions from last class, feel free to put them in the chat or, um, or raise your hand, and I can try to address those. I did try to give feedback to everyone's assignment. I saw some people said that they did see it, so that's great. If you sent me your assignment and I did not get back to it, I might have missed it. Um, so just feel free to send it again if you didn't get um, my feedback back on it, because I, I think I got through everyone's. Oh, great question that I'm just going to, I saw it pop up in the chat. Um, when should we use Replit and when should we use Google Colab? That is up to you. Um, I'm showing you both of them because you'll see both of them in the wild or um, while you're working on projects. So Replit, I see mostly used in instruction. So like this class here, it's a great tool for showing people how to use different programming languages or for learning a programming language because you don't have to install anything to run it. It's a computing environment. Um, and so that's just going to have a Python file. You write your code in it and you can run it and it's going to emulate what that might look like on a computer. That's a Python file. Um, Google Colab, on the other hand, is a notebook. This is used in a lot of documentation for libraries or for Python, um, for Python for Miranda. workshops. Um, please do raise your hand, don't just unmute, um, just so I can see who all is, is speaking, um, just because it confuses me. Um, and so I would recommend using Colab um, for data science or for taking your own notes, but really it's just what you like to use, I guess is my short answer. And yes, recording is going to be on YouTube. You don't have to let me know. Um, and yeah, awesome. And feel free, you can raise your hand. Whoever was trying to speak, you can raise your hand and speak. I just didn't know. Um, it's just hard for me to see. And it is jolting to hear someone say my name <laughs> out of nowhere. 
Amazing, amazing. Okay. Yes, and you can submit your assignments however you would like. I'll just be showing you the two different um, options you have. All right, any questions? Okay. Cool, cool. And um, let's see. Yeah, email's totally fine. Email's totally fine. All right, then let's start off with a review of Python data types. So when we left off last time, we talked a little bit about data types. Um, does anyone remember? Go ahead and put in the chat real quick if you remember what those four data types are that we talked about that we talked about last time. If anyone remembers, go ahead and put it in the chat. The four data types that we talked about. You can also open the slides <laughs> if you want to be confident in your answer. I don't mind if you look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. So got a lot of, yep, we've got integer, float, string. One more. One more that has kind of a funny name. Yep, Boolean, great, great, great. So we have integer, float, string, and Boolean. And just as a review, int, int, and this is a whole number, float, a floating point number. This will be a decimal. Um, String is a series of characters, always in quotes. Remember, Python's not going to know it's a, supposed to be a string unless you put it in those quotes. You can use double or single quotes. Just keep it uh, consistent. If you use uh, single quotes, make sure you close it with single quotes. If you use double quotes, make sure you close it and open it. When I say close and open, I realize sometimes I say these programming words that I've been saying for years, but if you're new, you may not know. So when I say open a parentheses or open a quote, I mean the first one. And when I say close, I mean the second one. And it's kind of like you're capturing this word here in quotation. So I say open and close, and that can also be with parentheses as well. Okay, so our four data types, oops, and a Boolean. I didn't talk about the Boolean and I mentioned it before. Um, so Boolean is just true or false. There's no, notice this is not a string. There's no quotes around this. This is literally something that Python recognizes if you type true with a capital T, T, capital T, R, U, E, that is a Boolean data type similar with false. And today we'll actually be looking at why that is useful, why that gets to be its own data type. And these types are important because they do allow for different operations as we discussed last time. So we looked at you can check the type of a variable or a value with this function type. So you could just say, um, you could put this in a print statement. So print type, and then put your variable in there or whatever value, and it will tell you if it's int, float, string, or bool. And we talked about why it's important to know this, because you can do certain operations with integers and floats, and you can do certain operations with strings, certain operations with booleans even, um, but you have to know what type you're dealing with to know what operations you can do. So strings, for instance, as a review, they can't be, in an operation with a float or an int, except in some special cases, which we will talk about later in the class. But strings can be concatenated together. It's called concatenation. When you take string one and string two and you shove them together, that is concatenation. And it's represented by the addition symbol right here. And so we looked at um, an example of that last time. If you want, you can go to last video if you want to review on that as well. And even numbers inside of these quotes are considered strings. Anything inside of these quotes is a string. All right, I'm going fast just because we talked about those last time. Do let me know if you want anything explained again, and I'll be happy to do that. Um, here's just something extra with strings, and you don't have to memorize this. I just want to mention it because I always have those students that try to go just a little bit past what I am teaching. Um, there is something called an escape character that you can include in a string. And this allows you to include characters that Python normally can't represent in a string, such as a new line. Um, so kind of like pressing enter on your keyboard, creating that new line, that's going to be backslash n. This backslash is going to open, is going to allow you to use what's called escape characters, which is not a forward slash, backslash. And it allows you to um, use these shortcuts 
kind of, for including some special characters in your strings. I'm just going to show this to you. You can use it or not. Um, we're not going to be using escape characters just yet, so don't worry about it if you don't know what this means. But for my people that like to get a little bit ahead, this is how you can use escape characters. Okay. Great, great, great. Now, uh, for typecasting, and I saw some people did include this in their homework. I was really happy to see it. You didn't have to. That was completely extra. Um, but typecasting allows you to convert one data type to another. This should say one data type to another. So, for instance, maybe you uh, want to convert the number five to five in quotes. And instead of putting five just putting five in quotes, you have like A equals five. You can cast A instead of being an integer to being a string. And we'll look at that. Sometimes this is useful. So let's say we have this number here and we say, okay, we want the integer version of 4.9. So you can actually just use the name of the data type you wanna cast it into. So int and then that value there. One interesting thing, this is not rounding, it's called, it's just truncating. So it's getting rid of the decimal part, anything past the decimal, and it's just going to return this whole number. That's uh, useful if you want to um, divide, is to do something called integer division, where you see how many times, you know, six can fit into 10. It's not going to be a whole number, but maybe you just want to see at most how many times. Um, Another example, like I said, if you want to convert a number to a string, you can say string 3.2. Some of you did this when you did some sort of math and you wanted to print out the result. Um, and so you printed your, you said, this is the answer. And then you printed the string version of that number. I'll show some examples of these. Similarly, if you have a number in quotes and you want to convert it to an integer, you can do that with um, int. So basically, if you have a type of variable, you want to convert it to another theta type, you can um, just use the name of that type, open parentheses, insert your uh, variable there, and then close parentheses. So um, we will be using this when we start getting input from the console, which is very exciting. And we'll also use it, I think mostly an input from the console, or if you are trying to append a number to a print statement. And let me show you an example of that. So now I'm going to show you an example, this time in Google Colab. All right. So I went ahead, go ahead. Hopefully you logged into Google Colab. Um, if you're, uh, if you have the same settings as me, you can have very nice cats going across the top of your screen. And of course, since it's June, they are pride themed, which is so cute. Um, but anyway, open Google Colab. Hopefully you have already signed in with your Gmail account and you can create a new file. So this is typically what it's going to look like. It'll say untitled. I changed mine to be control structures. The nice thing about notebooks or Colab in general is that you can add these little text cells. So notice when you hover around your notebook above or below, this is called a cell. Above or below the cell, you can add either a code block or a text block. This text block is in Markdown, which is um, a text formatting language. And so if you, um, you don't have to know Markdown, but if you see these little things, that's usually with Markdown. So I'm just gonna give my, notebook a title. Um, so I'm going to say control structures. And you don't have to do this. I just want to show you, um, you know, how you can use a notebook. So here I've given mine a title using this single hashtag. If you want to do different headers, you just add another hashtag at the end there. So I'm not going to really go into how to use Markdown. I just want to show you. You also don't have to have that at all. You just want to say control structures. But I like the way it looks. All right, so now I've given our notebook a title. Again, that's optional. I just like it for organization's sake, for organization's sake. And now let me go again with the with the typecasting of the data, the data types. So let's say we have our variable A is equal to 
of five. All right. And now if we print or a print statement, oops, print type A. This is going to print the type of our variable A. And notice I'm just typing into this what's called a cell here. It's a little different from Replit in that it's not all one giant file that's going to run all at one time. No matter how many cells you have, it's just going to run whichever one you press this play button on. Or what I usually do is I use the control, um, I use the shortcut control enter on my keyboard or command enter if you're on Mac. So I'm going to press this play button and it's going to run that code for me and then print the result down at the bottom. One reason that I like notebooks is because you can have very short snippets like that and it runs uh, very quickly. And you can keep this output while also, let's say maybe we make another variable and we say b equals 5.0 and then print type b. And then we can kind of compare what two different pieces of code do. So just one, just one reason to use a notebook is to um, take notes for yourself. So anyway, what I've done here, I've set up our variable A, and we're going to print type of A. And you can see it says int. And then similarly, we print B, which is 5.0. So that's going to be type float. And now let's say we want to cast. So some of you, um, let's say, let's do. I'm going to do an example here that I'm just going to kind of make up, which sometimes doesn't work out, but we'll see. So let's say I want to do something else that says print the value of A is. And some of you found that you can't just say print the value of A is and then say plus A because you're trying to add a string and an integer. That's not going to work. If I run this, it's going to say, can it's going to give me a very helpful error. Remember, errors are helpful. They tell you what's wrong. Can only concatenate string, not int, to string. So it's saying this needs to be a string to be able to concatenate it. So what we can do with typecasting is then type string A. And always remember, you need the, your opening, you need the same number of opening parentheses as you have closing parentheses. All right, so now let's run this now that we have typecast our integer to a string so we can print it. The value of A is five. So that's one use case for typecasting. Okay. So there's that quick example there. So let's talk about, because we were talking about these uh, different operations we can do, let's look at um, operations that we can do that will result in a Boolean. These are called comparison operators. So we looked at um, operations such as addition, subtraction, concatenation. Those are typical operators, but we also have comparison operators in which we're comparing two values. So you're probably familiar with this concept. Um, we're checking if two numbers are equal to each other, if a number one number is greater than the other number, if a number is less than another number, less than or equal to, you've probably seen this in your classes before. So um, how we can represent this in code is to and uh, do make sure that you're muted. How we can represent this in code um, is uh, with these symbols here. They're going to look a little different than you're used to on paper. So to check if two values are equal to each other, we can't just use the equal sign because that's our assignment operator. That's how we say variable A equals five, or that's how we say um, my string equals Miranda or something. So we can't just use one equal sign. So now we double it up. So we say equals equals. That's how I'm going to say it, okay? So we say five equals equals five. That's one example of a comparison operator. And when I um, do some operation like that, it's going to return a value. In this case, that value is going to be either true or false. So 5 equals 5 is going to result in, if we printed, print, tell Python to print 5 equal equal 5, it's going to say true. So let me just show you that real quick. Print 5 equal equal 5. So now it gives us this Boolean true. 
All right, you can try five equal equals six, and now it's false. So just an example of what that looks like when you run something like this. Okay, so this is going to allow you to compare different variables. Um, but one thing to note is you can only compare ints and floats together um, and strings and strings together. So you can't compare an int to a string because the word hello is not going to be greater than or equal to the number five. That doesn't exactly make sense. So we can only compare strings or numbers together, not mixing those two. But so here's some example. We have this exclamation mark equal is not equal to. So one is not equal to five. That will be true. Less than, greater than looks very much like you might see in a math class. So three is less than seven. Two is greater than negative one. And then we have less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. So three is less than or equal to five. Eight is greater than or equal to four. Um, so that is how we can uh, compare some values in our code. What about string comparison? So I said you can't com you can't compare numbers and strings, but you can compare strings and strings. So what we can actually do this helps us with uh, alphabetical order. Um, so one neat thing that Python includes is um, the ability to compare your strings. So you can uh, kind of sort them in a way. And so uh, this alphabetical order that is inherent is that, let me see, A is less than B. So your alphabet starts at A and ends at Z, and the values of those strings get bigger and bigger. This is just a way to think about it. So A, you can say A is less than B. Capital A is less than lowercase a. Hello is equal to that same string hello. So this is useful. Maybe think of um, a password. You need a user to enter a password. And so you want to check that what they enter is equal equal is the same as what that password value is. That's one basic way to implement a password. And um, checking, you know, comparing multiple strings, not just a couple letters. Like I said, you don't have to know the values of each individual letter. It's mostly just these less than or equal to signs for alphabetical order. Um, so you'll mostly use it if you need to put a list into alphabetical order, you can use these comparison operators. If you also um, want to check if a string exactly matches another, you can use the equal equal sign here. So let's try that out real quick. So I'm going to scroll down a bit. And so let's say I have string one equals um, the name Allison, and then string two equals the name Bob. Now I can say print, you know, string one is less than string two or something. So we can see that Allison comes before Bob and if we're putting those names in alphabetical order. Let's look at comparing if they are equal or not. Just use this equal equal operator. And that's of course going to be false. All right, so let's change the string a bit. Let's say lowercase Allison. Are these two the same string? Hmm. All right, I'll run it again. No, they are not. Remember, everything in Python is case sensitive, including um, our strings here. So now let's make this uppercase, and we can see if these two strings have the exact same value or not, and they do. So just a couple ways to compare strings. All right. And why are we talking about this? Oh, just kidding. You don't get to know why we're talking about it yet. We're going to be using it later in the class. Um, but let's 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 add a little bit more dimension to that. So we're doing comparisons, and maybe some of you are like, yeah, I already, I already know how to do this. Well, let's let's add in something else. So Python also includes these keywords, um, and an or. So the and keyword is going to check if two conditions are true. And if both are true, then the result of the overall statement is true. So let's see, condition and 
condition. This is going to return true if both of these conditions are true. It returns false if any of the conditions are false. And then we have the OR statement. This is going to be condition OR condition. This will return true if any of the conditions are true. So, um, you know, A or B. And it's false if both conditions are false. So let's look at some examples of using this AND and OR keywords. So we can say an expression here, 5 is greater than 1 and 5 is less than 10. All right, go ahead and put in the chat, what do you think? Is this going to be true or false? 5 is greater than 1 and 5 is less than 10. True or false? Yep, just this first one, just this first one. Yeah, great, great, everyone. I love this interaction. I love it. You guys are very interactive. Okay. Yes, so that's going to be true. And how we know that is that five is greater than one. We have our keyword and five is less than 10. Both of these statements are true. So the overall statement with connected with this and connector is true. All right, next one. 10 mod two or four is less than one. Don't think we talked about mods quite yet. Let's just see some people's guesses. So 10 mod, I'm actually trying to think that might be a, I think that's a typo. I think that's actually supposed to be 10 is greater than two. Okay, I was I was confused by that. All right, sorry about that. 10 is greater than two or four is less than one. And what is this answer gonna be? 10 is greater than two or four is less than one. So remember, this is the or keyword. So only one of them has to be true for the entire statement to be true. All right, and I'm going to reveal that answer in five, four, three, two, one. True. So this is the OR keyword, only one of them. So it's um, saying if you ask someone, um, let's say someone asks me, Miranda, do you have tea or coffee? And I say, yes, I have tea. Or yes, I have coffee. I don't have to have both of them because you're saying or. If someone asks me, Miranda, do you have tea and coffee? And if I don't have both of those, I have to say, no, I only have tea. Or no, I only have coffee. Um, but in the case of or, it's true if just one of the statements is true. And that's supposed to be um, a less than symbol or a greater than symbol instead of this here. Let me fix that again. Okay, apologies for that. All right, now this next one. Okay, go ahead and put your answers in here for the next one, 10 equal equal five or seven is less than 7.15. Go ahead and put your answers in the chat. Is this overall going to be true or false? Ten equal equal How do I do that or thing? Seven. How do you do the so, or? So please um, raise your hand if you're going to ask a question. There's a reaction on Zoom that says raise hand. Um, don't just shout out your answer. Because um, otherwise it really confuses me. So you should be able to raise your hand from Zoom. If you need some help with that, you can put it in the chat. And we haven't we haven't gone over how to do this in Python just yet, but I'm just asking, is this going to be true or false? 10 equal equal 5 or 7 is less than 1, 5. Yep. So I see this correct statement in here. If anything is in an or statement is true, the whole thing is true. So, okay, this is, there's a lot of mistakes in this. I don't know how I didn't catch this because seven, 
point zero is less than seven. Okay. Miranda's making lots of mistakes. Oh. Okay, we'll just try we'll just try this out. My slides had several mistakes in it. So if it's an or statement and it's 10 equal equal five or, then only one of these has to be true. So this one is true. So that whole statement is true. However, on the next slide, it then says and. So if this is an and statement, then both of these have to be true. And 10 equal equal five is false. So this whole thing is false. I'm not really sure what happened with this chart here, but let's try it out in Python to make more sense since I did have a messed up chart. That's very strange. All right, so let's see, how do we do this in Python? You can literally just say and and or. So let's say a, uh, let's say num1 equals five, num2 equals seven. All right, now let's say, num, so let's say print, num1 is less than num2. Right, so that's going to give us true. Okay, now let's add an and statement in there. And I like to put in some parentheses here. Let me break it out for you to make it a little easier to see. So I'm going to say statement. I'm going to set a new statement variable to be our two statements, all right? And I'm going to fill these parentheses in with our statement. So let's say statement is num1 is less than num2 and num1 is greater than zero. So now if I print statement, what do we think this will print? So num1 is less than num2, 5 is less than 7, and num1 is greater than 0. All right, let's see. So if we run this, our statement is true. Let's try again with a different statement. So I'm going to copy this and paste. So now let's change something up. Let's say num1 is less than num2 and num1 is less than zero. Now, what is this going to output? Go ahead and put in the chat, what is this statement going to be when we have the statement being num1 is less than num2 and num1 is less than zero? All right, we've got a couple guesses. Couple guesses, thank you. All right, in five, four, three, two, one, let's see. So if I run this cell, it's false. And the reason it's false is we're using this and statement. That means both the statement on the left and the statement on the right have to be true. Num1 is less than num2, 5 is less than 7, but num1, 5 is not less than 0. Let's try an example with or. So now if we change this to or, now what is the answer going to be? So we have everything's the same. We've just changed the statement from num1 is less than num2 or num1 is less than zero. And now what will the value of statement of this statement be? Now we're using the or keyword. So before it was false, now we change this from and, where both statements have to be true, to or, where only one statement needs to be true. And I'll reveal the answer in five, four, three, two, one. 
Amazing. Great job, everyone. So this is going to be true. That's because now we're using the or keyword. Only one of these has to be true for our entire statement to be true. So in this case, num1 is less than num2. That is true. But num1 is not less than zero. However, we just use an or keyword. So it overall is true since this statement is true. So with an or statement, only one side needs to be true. Now let's try this last example here. And as I get requests for more examples, of course, let's switch this up. Num1 is greater than or equal to num2, or num1 is less than zero. Now, what will be the result of this here? What is our statement going to be, true or false? Num1, so five, is greater than or equal to seven, or num1, five, is less than zero. Now, what is this going to print? Go ahead and put those answers in the chat. Amazing, amazing. Great, great, and five, four, three, two, one. Perfect, thank you everyone for your answers, let's find out. And that's false. I think I think most everyone got that and that is because we have two false statements here so that or statement is false. Brendan, yes. Hello, Miranda, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good, Chris and I just found out that Python also implements the not keyword, which is also a crucial player in the um, logical statements. Did yes. you want to go over that too? We can, let me think about it for just five seconds. Okay, so I'll show a quick example of the not keyword. Thank you for that, Brenton. So um, if I put, let's make it a little bit confusing. You have to kind of think of the logic behind it. So I'm gonna say, let's take these out again. The, another keyword that Python has is not. And like I said, I'm just gonna go over this quickly. It's not in the plan today, so don't worry if um, it's a little confusing, but it will negate, it will flip or negate whatever is um, next to it. So if I say not, uh, let's do a small statement here. So let's say, so right now num1, num1 is less than num2. So this is true, but if I put not in front of it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when your kids, um, at least when I was a kid, um, little kids would try to be annoying and I uh, would say, oh, I like your hair, not. And then that would say, oh, actually they don't like your hair or, oh, I really like this food, not. And then that would negate it. It's very much the same in Python. So use this not keyword. And now if I run this, it's going to flip this from true to false. So not is going to take any truth value, any Boolean, and then make it the opposite one. So let's try. So if I get rid of this not again, right? Num1 equal equal num2. Normally, this is going to produce false. But now if I add the not keyword, then it's going to be true. So something else to keep in mind if you just decide to make it even more complicated on yourself. <laughs> yes, it switches false statement to true. Yep, 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 bonus content unlocked. Okay, so why are we going through all of this true, false, um, and or all of this nonsense. Why am I even making you guess all of these things? Well, the answer is control structures. This is a way for us to control which lines of code in Python will run or be skipped entirely. And we can actually choose which lines of code to run using something like these true false statements. So this, um, sometimes a control structure will set a condition four lines of code to run. So you can say, you know, if num2 is less than num1, then we're gonna run this line of code. However, if it's not less than 
if num1 is not less than num2 or whatever I just said, then we're going to run this code instead. So we use these true false statements to guide which lines of code we want. Another way we can do this is to set a number of times for our code to run. So this is using um, not always our Booleans, but it's a control structure that allows us to loop a code block, a set of lines of code is a code block, loop a code block to run um, either a set number of times or some indefinite number of times. So this first one, setting a condition for your lines of code to run is a conditional. We'll look at the if statement today. And then setting a number of times for your code to run is a loop. There's two types of loops that we will look at. There's for and while, but we'll get to those, I think, next week. So today we're going to be looking at this part, conditionals, which is going to set a condition that needs to be true for our code to run. OK, so let's look at some diagrams, because sometimes this is very abstract and it's hard to um, hard to look at words and code and make it make sense in your brain. So I'm a visual learner. So bear with me um, on this diagram that I created. So in our typical code sequence, what we've been doing up until now is this basic control structure where if you imagine each block here to be a line of code, then we just have this line of code runs and then this line of code runs, and then this line of code runs. And it's going to go down our entire Python file, running each line of code one by one, one after the other. So for example, we have this code block, which says statement one equals hello. All right, I've assigned this variable. Python moves to the next line. Statement two equals my name is Miranda. Python moves to the next line. Print statement one, then print statement two. So you can see it's very stepwise in this sequence. We're just going down the file. This is what we've been doing. We've just been writing our code one line at a time. But now we're going to talk about how we can maybe change up this flow chart a little bit, change which lines of code run and when. So let's look at a diagram like this, where we have a statement. Remember those statements we were practicing earlier? We have a statement. If this statement is true, we're going to run this block of code. If the statement is false, we're going to run this block of code. So you have two different options that your code can run based on this statement. This is when we're going to talk about if statements. So we're going to say if num1 is less than num2, if that's true, then run this line, run this code. And then after that, we're just going to follow the arrows again. So let's say our statement is true. We're going to go from this statement block to statement what to our code one and then code three. Remember, each of these boxes here is just a line of code. I just numbered them. So if this is true, one, then three. But if it's false, then our code is going to run two and then three. And you can make this as complicated or as simple as you'd like. But this is an example of a flow structure that we're going to look at in a little bit. Another structure you can have, which we'll look at next week, is this loop here, where we evaluate a statement. If it's true, run this code block. And then evaluate the statement again. If it's still true, run the code block. And so you can see this will keep looping. It will keep going and going until finally you evaluate the statement and it's false. You say, Miranda, well, how, how can a statement change from true to false? Well, typically you have something in this line of code that's going to alter um, a variable that's used in this statement. So let's say we want to say num1 is less than num2. Let's say num1 is 0 and num2 is 1. But what if we get into this code block and now it says, num1 is now equal to 5. OK, so first it's 0 is less than 1. That's true. Run this code block. It's going to set num1 to 5. Go back to this statement. And now the original statement is false. And we run this code. If you don't quite follow me yet, that's OK. I just wanted to show a diagram for my people that like diagrams. But on a basic level, we're going to evaluate a statement and then follow the arrows where they take us based on true and false.
Today, we're going to look at this type of control structure where we're just going to go and align here. So we're not adding any loops just yet. We're just going to say evaluate a statement. If it's true, run this line. If it's false, run this line. All right. Please do put your questions in the chat. Not, don't private message me because I am not likely to see it. Um, but you're, you're, if you don't want to share your question with everyone else, you're, you're, you can definitely email me after the class. All right. If you have questions, do put them in the chat or raise your hand at any point. I'm going to take a sip of my tea. Keandre, yes. Me. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, when we do our assignments at the end of each class session, are we um are we allowed to help our other classmates to you know you know to complete their assignment, or do we just do it on our own? However, you learn best is totally fine. So uh, you have to remember this class is not um, for a grade. This is just a free class that we offer. So I do give feedback on your code, but if you would want help from others, I encourage you to get help from others or to help each other. Totally fine. All right. So let's save some class-wide questions for at the end of class, and let's get back to those um, control structures. So we're going to look at conditional statements. Conditional statements is a code block that's only going to run if your condition is true. So we're going to use those comparison operators that we looked at just moments ago and use what's called an if statement. And the syntax of this, remember Python syntax, if condition. And then we're going to have our code in here. Something that I want you to notice is now we're starting to use indentations or you know how indentation, you know how a paragraph is indented. Um, it just means that instead of this margin right here, you move the margin to the inside. You can do this just by pressing the tab key. Make sure you're just pressing the tab key. It's not the space bar, it's the tab key. So press tab to indent your code. And you're gonna start seeing more and more indentations. This is specific to Python. And when we have something like this, a control structure like this, if condition, anything that runs when that condition is true is going to be indented so that you can see, kind of like making it its own little block. You can see what code is going to run if that condition is true. So this is called inside, I'm going to say inside and outside of our if statement. So inside the if statement is indented. And it's going to have your code here. This is going to run only if our condition is true. Outside the if statement is right in line with all of the rest of our code. And um, that's going to run regardless. It's just going to be the next line that runs after our if statement. So here's an example. So we haven't talked about this first line here and the eighth line here, and that's totally fine. But just look at the code starting here, where we have, imagine this line right here, x equals 1, y equals 1. Now here's our if statement. If, then our statement, x equal equal y, print, x is equal to y. So what do we have here? We have two variables. And then we have an if statement. We're using that Python keyword if. We put our statement using our um, comparison operators. So if x equal equal y, then indent your code. This is what's going to run if that condition is true. It's going to print x is equal to y. OK, so let's look at some examples of this. So go ahead and take what we have here. <clears throat> so what we have if, so x is equal to 11. If x is greater than 10, print x is greater than 10. So let's see what happens with this if statement. 
So I'm going to just add another section here for myself. So if statements print. So I've just copied here. So we have x equals 11. If x is greater than 10, print x is greater than 10. What do you think is going to happen when I run this? Go ahead and put in the chat. What do you think is going to happen? All right, what's going to happen when I run this cell? So if this statement is true, then this code is going to run. Yep, yep, yep. All right, seeing a lot of good guesses, seeing a lot of good guesses. Okay, let's go ahead and reveal that answer. Oop. Okay, so sometimes when you copy and paste, weird things happen. So this is, it's not recognizing the quotes that are within the uh, PowerPoint, that's okay. All right, let's, let me type that out again. If X is greater than 10, print. Okay, now let's try that again. X is greater than 10, perfect. So a lot of you got that, great, great job. Yes, that's called a, yeah, that's related to Unicode. If you wanna know more info, ask me, ask me later. Um, but so we have X is equal to 11. If this statement is true, then this code is going to run. All right, now what's gonna happen if I say, now what's gonna happen? So go ahead and put it in the chat. This is a really great, I'm gonna have these kinds of exercises a lot where I'm going to ask you to read some code and tell me what happens. This is a very important coding uh, skill to have. So go ahead, tell me, now that I've added this line here, what happens now? So if I run this again, maybe I can clear this. Ah, sometimes it lets me clear it. All right, so now when I run this, what happens? Go ahead and put in the chat. All right, all right. Great, great. Awesome, awesome. Okay, in five, four, three, two, one. Perfect, thank you for all of your input. So let's let's think through this. This is how I think through it. So we've got X is equal to 11. Okay, I'm gonna save that in my brain. If X is greater than 10, I'm gonna evaluate this in my brain. Let's see, X is 11, so 11 greater than 10, that's true. So this is going to print. So the first thing we should see printed is this exact statement, X is greater than 10. Now we're outside of the if statement, we're just back to our normal sequence of code. And now this is gonna print whether or not this is true. We're outside of that if statement, so now it's gonna print code finished. So to summarize, we should have, if our coding intuition is correct, we should have X is greater than 10 printed and then code finished printed. So let's check. And we are correct. Good job, everyone. So that's an example of our if statements. I have a couple more examples here if you want to look at them. We have just a couple minutes left in class, so I do want to make sure that I get everything you need for the assignment. So one thing that, um, just a couple more things to say before the end of class, you can have multiple, you know, you can check as many conditions as you want. So if you want to check if X is greater than 10, and then you also want to check if X divided by, if X mod two is equal to zero, that means is there zero remainder when X is divided by two? Um, you can do that. You can check both of these conditions. Just put another if statement. Um, you could even, making it a little more complicated, you could even put an if statement inside an if statement if you indented all of this and then have another if statement that's only run if the first one is, you can make this however you want. But, so you can run these in a sequence if you want. But let's say that we don't want just some if statements. We want, oh yes, Nathan, go ahead.
Nathan, I think your signal's not great. Go ahead and put your question in the chat, and then one of the TAs can help me answer it. Make sure it's to everyone um, and not private. Or if you need it to be private, um, I can check it after class. I think your signal's not great because we couldn't really hear you. Do you want to try again? Oh, OK. Um, so uh, we'll address that later. OK. All right. So now we have multiple if statements. Um, so but what if we want to do an if statement and then if this statement is false, we check another statement. So right now, whether or not this statement is true or false, it's also going to check the next one. But what if we want to check another condition? That's going to be checking after your first if statement. Next, you want to check another if statement. So you're saying if this, but if that's false, what about this? And if that's false, what about this? So that's like if I, uh, this is called an LF statement. So I can say, Miranda, do you have coffee? And if I say no, then my next question is, Miranda, do you have tea? So that's an example of an LF. So I'm going to say, if Miranda has coffee, oh, Miranda doesn't have coffee. Okay. L if Miranda has tea. So this is a shortened version. It's called else if, but in Python, we write L if. So here's an example of L if. So x equals 1. If x is greater than 10, print this statement. L if x is less than 5, print this statement. So we're going to have x equals 1. So x greater than 10, that's false. This if statement will not run. So now we're going to go to the elif and check this instead. Elif, x is less than 5. Oh, that's true. Now we're going to print. OK, and then there's else. But given the amount of time that we have left, OK, I think I can make it. All right, so let's try elif real quick. All right, so now let's say x is equal to 1. If x is greater than 10, ah. Sometimes Colab can guess what you want to type. Semi new feature. Very new. Nathan, do you have another question? Your hand is still up. OK. Awesome. OK, cool. So if x is greater than 10, print as x is greater than 10. Otherwise, l if, else if. And now I'm going to put another statement. x is less than 5. And And you can put whatever you want in this print statement. You know, you could put blah in this print statement. You could put, right. So you don't have to describe. Usually you're kind of in a print statement trying to describe what is going on. OK, so now let's see what happens when we run this. So it's going to go x equals 1. If x is greater than 10, well, that's false. So this is not going to run at all. L if x is less than 5, well, that's true. So now this statement's going to run. Awesome. So see that there. Let's try again. Just one more example to show you. Oh, I see we've hit 6 o'clock. I'm just going to show this very quick. So now if I change this to if x is less than 10, it's going to print this. L if is only going to run if the if statement doesn't run. So because our if statement ran here, because this was true and it ran, it's just going to ignore this. So Python is um, it has this pattern. It's going to be if, elif. And then another one we're going to learn is else. Else is just going to be anything else. Print something. So we have this structure here that we will review more next time. I do have an assignment that goes over if statements, else statements, so you will get some practice with that. Go ahead and practice it and give it a try, and then we'll go over it in more detail next time. So I do get a lot of questions about the assignments last time, so I only emailed them the first week because I messed up the first week. But all the time, the assignments will be in the slides. And um, I'm going to actually get rid of 
I'm going to cut those out because we didn't get to it, which is fine. That was extra stuff. So if you go to the very end of the slides that I shared, then that's where your assignment is. You can email that to me. Like I said, it's completely optional. If it helps you to submit an assignment, then do that. If it doesn't help you, if that stresses you out, then don't do it. Um, and please do interact with each other, help each other out on the Discord. All right, well, that is the end of class. Uh, thank you so much for showing up this evening. I hope you have um, a really lovely evening. All right, please um, hold on, Nathan. Um, and thank you so much. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, and then if you have some questions, you can um, you can stay for a couple minutes or so. All right, thank you so much. See you all next time.